Hello, for me, this is one of, if not the most difficult cases in dentistry. Much harder than veneering 10 maxillary anterior teeth or doing a full mouth reconstruction as far as getting a perfect result. This is placing or replacing a crown on a single dark central incisor. And from the get-go, you tell, you know, at least I know, and this is using the finest laboratory technicians in the world, as, as good as I can get, money is no object. This young woman had this crown on this right central incisor and you can see how the gingival tissue is dark, and I replaced it with this one. She thought this was an all porcelain crown, but it turned out to be porcelain to metal. And see how the underlying tooth is dark, and so the gingival tissue, I mean, there's dark shine through the tissue, because as technician Willie Geller told me one time that metal light refraction goes up into the root of the tooth and comes out through the gingival tissue and then I've replaced it with this one and that is the best I could do. So this is a case of me not trying to show you work that you go, oh my God, that guy is so good. He's got to be the best that ever lived. I'm showing you the best I can do trying to place a maxillary central incisor. And so if this young woman had not been realistic about the final result, it's, it's almost like a set of dentures. You could spend your life trying to make dentures comfortable and ideal. That's why I don't do dentures without implants. I don't want to get on that hamster wheel. And so what I'm showing you is the best I could do with a dark, central incisor, though this is before and this is after. And see, this has got good light refraction. The color is close, but we're fighting a dark tooth under the crown. To make it more difficult, you couldn't internally bleach the tooth because the tooth had composite, it had endo and you couldn't internally bleach it because there was composite in the orifice. So what are you dealing with here? You'll see once I take this crown off, and again, she thought it was an all porcelain crown. It was actually porcelain to metal. So they actually did a decent job with porcelain to metal, but the tooth had turned dark after the endo and that metal refracts underneath the crown up the root and makes all of this dark and in addition to the tooth being dark. So there's no getting rid of this dark shadow. Now in some cases you say, well why didn't you do both teeth, crowns on both teeth? These adjacent teeth were so attractive she had broken this tooth when she was much younger and it had that uh, crown on the tooth since she was in her teens and now she's in her 30s. We just thought about it and hated to prep the adjacent teeth because I've still got to deal with the underlying dark tooth with a, a this is a lithium desilicate or Emax crown and you know you would hate to prep this tooth and still not have an ideal match because of the dark underlying tooth. So what I'm showing you is the best I could do with, in my opinion, one of the finest technicians in the world. So this is before. You can see it's had, the tooth has had endodontics and the tooth has turned dark. We'll look at that in a moment too. So topical anesthetic, then use this painless and profound maxillary local anesthetic technique, it will change your practice. People worry about injections. If you can give a painless and profound dental injection, you will be a hero to the patient. So this is going to be the provisional method. This is a great way to make a provisional crown. Michelle Hines is a dentist here in Waco, and she actually showed me 
this technique. I'd not used that before, and it's a it's a fabulous provisional technique. So we're first going to cut the crown off, and both this young woman who was a dentist and I thought this was an all porcelain crown. And once I started cutting into it, I was surprised, and she was also surprised that it was a porcelain to metal crown. So you really don't have a chance with a porcelain to metal crown. With an all porcelain crown or a lithium to silicate crown, you've got a fighting chance to get within the ballpark, depending on the shade of the tooth, now the adjacent tooth. Now the thing that made it so difficult also was you see all the translucency in the adjacent teeth and translucency is a very difficult thing to incorporate into a crown. So I took this on just as a teaching case and that's what I told her. I said, I'll take it on and put this on my YouTube channel as the best I could do knowing it's probably not going to be ideal. Now you'll know I have cases in my library of matching central incisors to adjacent teeth and the match is really good because the teeth were just normal colored there wasn't a dark tooth you're just matching veneers on two central incisors to adjacent teeth and that's hard to do but I could do it this I knew you were going to get close but it wasn't going to be a home run. Now what I'm doing is cutting some spaces inter, uh, on the interproximal of the adjacent teeth so I've got a space to move the pieces into. This crown was cemented very well. I'm trying not to cut into the tooth, just cutting through the porcelain with a small thin coarse barrel diamond and cutting through the metal with a 330 carbide burr and then torque it with some type of elevator or you can use the square end of an amalgam carver. So you can see how dark that tooth was. The prep was pretty good. So I'm going to refine the prep. So you want to prep into the sulcus, but you don't want to invade the junctional epithelium, the attached gingiva. You want to keep the prep in the sulcus. If you prep into the attached gingiva, into the junctional epithelium, you'll get inflamed red gingival tissue, and you don't want that. I want the tissue to be healthy. So I'm probably uh, prepping a half millimeter, maybe to a millimeter, into the gingival sulcus. Now the gingival sulcus is probably a millimeter and a half. You know how shallow the gingival sulcus, sulcus sulci are often on maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth. So I can only prep about half a millimeter or so into the sulcus and I'm trying to cut it back as much as I can but since the tooth has had endodontics you know the and it had it probably 15 years ago, the tooth is going to be more brittle. And if you remove a lot of tooth structure circumferentially around the tooth and you have endodontics on the tooth, the chances of the person fracturing the tooth at the gum line are pretty great. That actually happened to me about 40 years after I'd had endodontics and a crown on my upper left cuspid. So you can see the composite in the orifice for the endo, so you can't go into the orifice and clean that out and, and internally bleach the tooth. That's why when I've done endodontics on teeth, I usually like to place IRM in the orifice. If you ever had to re-enter the tooth, you can take all of that IRM out you can get all of it out and you could internally bleach it if you needed to, if it was an anterior tooth. So I'm reprepping the tooth. This is a fine chamfer diamond. And I'm about, so I want to be about 
half to a millimeter subgingival on the facial. You want to know the depth of the sulcus first because you don't want to prep through the bottom of the sulcus. You don't want to prep into the junctional epithelium or you've got a whole new set of problems. And then in approximately and on the palatal, you only want to be about a half millimeter subgingival. You actually don't even have to be, you don't have to prep subgingivally on the palatal. They're just refining. So this is probably a two millimeter depth prep on the facial. You want the technician to have room for a thickness of lithium to silicate to try to block out the dark shadow as much as possible. Again, you can see the composite filling material. So internal bleaching is not going to happen because you can't remove the composite and get it out of the dentin unless you prep significantly into the dentin in the, the orifice, in the pulp chamber. And that's going to also weaken the tooth. So it's just about as hard a case as you can have. I'm marking the central incisors in this matrix, and this is blue moose matrix, placing my bisacrylate, wet the teeth really well, and then put this to place and have the patient bite down. And the thing I like about this provisional technique that Dr. Hines showed me is the occlusion is even better than if you use a polyvinyl siloxane matrix because the patient is biting it to place seeing good crisp margins. Now we're taking some shade photos and I'll take four or five, I probably sent five or six shades photos to email them to the laboratory technician, marking the interproximal contacts. You can use flowable composite to repair any little chips or voids in your provisional. It adheres to the bisacrylate material. This is a Shofu polishing disc. She was from out of state, so you know you always want to place a nice provisional, but since she was a dentist and from out of state, you especially wanted it to be as nice as you could make it. I don't want I want to be able to pull uh, this thin marking material from between the central incisors. You can watch my video on principles of occlusion and I go through that. Then I'm just idealizing the margins with the flowable composite. And I'm wetting the tooth and then pushing it to place to get as ideal and then using a plastic instrument to place that flowable composite, just creating as ideal a margin as I can with this provisional. Before you even think about doing a case like this, I think the prosthodontist was a smart guy and he said, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. You're just, you know, you're not going to have, unless you just happen to absolutely hit a home run or if the adjacent teeth are not translucent. Translucency is the enemy. It's really hard to match that in a single crown. Remember, go ahead and floss when you place your provisional crown or your permanent crown, but don't remove the excess looting composite 
until it has initial set because you want to peel it away. You never want to wipe it away. And that's provisional R final cement or veneer looting composite for that matter. I'm flossing that with wax floss. Ideal length. See the translucency in these adjacent teeth. They're beautiful teeth, but it's just nearly impossible to match. Okay, so that's the provisional. Now this is a different appointment and we're gonna take our impressions and some more photos for shade. That uh, gray rubber shofu wheel is excellent for adjusting the palatal or the lingual of maxillary or mandibular provisional crowns. So we're taking an impression of the provisional and I'm saying to my laboratory technician, this is a good length. I've idealized the length so he knows that this is an ideal length. See, the tissue looks really good. We're gonna place the cord on the facial. Now, I'm just barely gonna place it interproximally because if you place it too forcefully interproximally, you can strangulate the papilla and the papilla will necrose. So just barely place it interproximally at all into the sulcus. And then just, just barely interproximal. Then I'm gonna take some more shade photos. So we decided it was the OM2. And that ended up being about the way the final crown looked. But see, this translucency is just death. It's just, see, all this translucency is really hard for a laboratory technician to, to capture, especially in one single central incisor crown. Now, if it was a cuspid, kind of out of the way, that is doable. I've got one myself, and it's pretty good. But I'm using different F-stops to try to give him a different look so we can do the best that we can. So that was my objective with this case. It wasn't perfect. It was just to make it real close and show you what you might expect if you get into something like this. Now the best method is just, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do it. But she wanted to try it and I was willing to try it just to make this video. And we blocked out the teeth. And again, this is the OM2 is pretty, you know, it's pretty close. So using a custom polyether tray. I like polyether because it's uh, hydrophilic. It likes water. And wet the tooth, remove the cord, and you can either squirt the, the wash material directly on the teeth you're impressing, or you can leave it, put it, squirt it on top of the unset polyether. I usually like to squirt it on the inset polyether unless it's an inlay or an onlay or something with lugs that you are a real narrow interproximal prep area. You can see how accurate that is. And then we're going to chase it with a reversible hydrocolloid impression. So we've always got two impressions. Anytime I prep a tooth, I either take two reversible hydrocolloid impressions, see how accurate that is. If it's single tooth, if it's two teeth or more, I take a polyether with custom tray and a reversible hydrocolloid impression. Those are the two most accurate. I don't like to scan impressions if it's a subgingival margin. I've got a scanner, I've tried it both ways, my technicians and I both think a, a conventional impression with polyether or reversible hydrocolloid is more accurate if you have a subgingival margin. It's very difficult to capture a subgingival margin scanning. See how accurate that is? Now 
This is a good provisional material, the Olympia. And I'm going to go ahead and floss the interproximal contact as soon as I place the provisional. But again, I'm not going to remove the excess uh, provisional material until it has reached initial set. Always peel it off, don't wipe it off. Had part of that pal margin fractured, so I'm adding a little bit with the flowable composite. This is a fine chamfer diamond. Using that to adjust the occlusion and finish the margin. And then I'm going to use these gray Shofu rubber wheels for adjusting the occlusion and polishing the palo of the provisional. Okay, so this is what we've decided we're going to go with. An OM2 shade with some modification. Uh, try to capture the light refraction as best the technician can, but we're just trying to get it close. So here's a provisional after it's been in place for probably three weeks, and there's the final crown. You can see there's a lot of light refractions, translucency, margins are good. Use the solid model to perfect the interproximal contacts. This is the die model and this is a solid model. Always use a solid model to perfect interproximal contacts. If you want to have minimal adjustment on interproximal contacts, use a solid model. Look at the video on this link that shows you how to treat the solid model. I want the technician to have this in every lithium to silicate case just to know it's been etched. I trust the technician to do that, but I want to see it with my own eyes to know it's been treated. Okay, so this is the provisional, this is the crown, and it's, it's close. So I'm wiping the tooth with isopropyl alcohol Tissue looks good. It was rather stunning to me. Mm -hmm. Then I'm wiping the crown with isopropyl alcohol. Now the, the Emax crown has been treated, placing Vaseline on the interproximal surfaces to keep cement from setting in the interproximal, wiping it with either isopropyl alcohol or tubulacid, tubul then you're squirting the uh, Unisim cement just around the margins. Push that to place. It'd be done in the country. Floss it, but don't remove the excess looting composite until it has initially set. You know, one of the hardest parts in dentistry is being able to accept very good in some cases, perfect is my favorite word, but sometimes you just can't get perfect. You've got to be willing to settle for very good or you would just go absolutely nuts because it's, I won't say it's unattainable, but you would spend your life just redoing crowns or redoing things. I want some protrusive contact on this tooth, but I want to be able to pull shim stock through between the, te the, the uh, anterior teeth. I just want contact in protrusive. So here's the final crown. That's before. That's before, and this is after. So you're never going to get rid of this dark area right here, and that's from the dark tooth just shining through the gingival tissue. You can see the gingival tissue is very healthy. 
So that's probably the best I could do. And I wanted to show that. So you think about that when you're trying to match a dark single central incisor. You're probably not going to be able to do it unless the adjacent teeth were monochromatic and not translucent. Then maybe you could. If, if the tooth you're restoring, though, is dark, you've got so many things in play, it's going to be probably the most as difficult a case as you'll ever do. That's the dental minute. These techniques work, and they work every time. It's time. It is time to take your dentistry practice to the next level, and you know it. You just haven't known how to do it until right now. That's where DentistryMasterClasses.com steps in. At DentistryMasterClasses.com, Dr. Cutbreath is offering you his greatest work and his best cases. Here's everything that you're going to get when you subscribe to DentistryMasterClasses.com. Incredible comprehensive cases not seen in Dental Minute videos, an organized library of all the Dental Minute videos, and Dentistry Masterclasses comprehensive cases for study and reference. And you're going to get before and after photos of Dr. Cutbreath's fantastic restored work. So, great deal. 40 bucks, that is it. For 40 bucks, you're gonna get all of this. So go right now to dentistrymasterclasses.com and subscribe today and change your life, change your practice.